Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Shir. Uh, I currently uh, finish my work at Bluevine as a lead data scientist, and now I'm starting to work at Intuit. Both companies are great, both are hiring, so <laughs> you're welcome to, to approach me for any of them, or both. <laughs> and I came here today to continue Liron's talk about imbalanced data set and talk a little bit about, not about how you handle it with the modeling part, but how you handle the imbalance in the data uh, in evaluating your model. Because what kind of metrics do you usually use for evaluating your models? Example, yeah? AUC or area under precision with color cutoff. Okay, something else? F1. F1, okay, anything else? Precision. Uh, balance accuracy. Accuracy, yeah, precision. A uh, balanced accuracy, okay. Hey, gut feeling. <laughs> gut feeling. <laughs> okay, okay. So we're going to talk uh, today about what is imbalanced data set. Of course, most of you know that. Um, why won't you, you don't want to use accuracy for an imbalanced data set, as you, most of you probably know. Now, if you do use other metrics, which are better, like precision and recall and rock metrics, which are better in which cases? Because sometimes precision and recall are not the best also for a imbalanced data set, and sometimes the rock metrics are not that good, and we will just talk about the cases where you want to use which. And, um, and that's it, we're gonna see it in a few examples, and then we're gonna conclude. So imbalanced data set, as you all know, it has many applications, fraud detection, anomaly detection. Uh, for example, in Bluevine, we want to approve deals automatically for uh, loans for small businesses. So for example, most of the deals uh, we get are good deals and we want to approve them automatically, but the deals which are not good uh, or we're not sure about, then uh, we don't want to approve automatically and then we give them to an analyst revision. So in this case scenario, most of the deals are good. They are the positive deals and they are the majority. Um, but if we will approve all the deals, then uh, it will be very bad because we will approve also the deals which are uh, bad. So it's important for us to be accurate on the deals we approve. It, the precision is very important for us. But for example, if we have a, a fraud a model, we want to detect fraud. So fraud are usually a small a part of the population because fraudulent deals are a, a usually not many. So in this case, the precision is important, but also, and more important, is the recall, because we don't want to miss a, a fraud case. So uh, we also have to always think about what is our uh, business metric we, we want to optimize. Um, so these are many uh, two different cases, where in one case, the majority class is the positive class, and in the other, the other case, the minority class is the positive class. Okay, so why not accuracy? It's very easy, of course. Because if you have imbalanced data set, like 90%, 10%, if the model is a naive model and it's a, always saying the majority class, then it will have 90% accuracy, right? It is great, but it is a really bad model. So, not accuracy. Now, precision and recall, small recap. Uh, what is precision? Precision is the probability that out of the samples we said that are positive, we are actually correct in these samples. Okay, it is the green part uh, versus all the circle here. The circle is all the samples we say that are positive. The left part is all the positive samples and the right part is all the negative samples. And now what is the recall? Is how many of the positive did we catch out of our data? Some kind of coverage uh, metric. And now what is the rock? Rock is a curve, as you all know. Also, there is a curve for precision or recall, of course. And every point in the rock curve stands for a different threshold we uh, choose for our model. Uh, most of the models produce probabilities, and we want to choose which uh, threshold uh, uh, to use. So we, use, uh, we, we try to find the optimal point for us on the rock curve. Now each point uh, stands for a different threshold, and each point has a different true positive rate and false positive rate, as you all know. Now today we're gonna focus just on one point, what is true positive rate and false positive rate. The whole curve is not interesting right now. 
Um, so what is the uh, true positive, right? It is exactly the recall. How many good samples did we catch? Uh, what is the false positive, right? Is the probability of false or harm. How many false positives uh, we have divided by the total number of negatives we have? Okay, so it looks similar to precision and recall, but actually it's not. So uh, what is the difference? Um, can someone tell me what is the difference? Did you notice? Between what? Between the rock matrix and the precision and recall. The rock matrix is depends on the threshold. No, but I set a threshold now when I look at the true positive rate and the false positive rate. Okay, so I will help you. The difference is that false positive rate is not precision because true positive rate is recall. Okay, so this is the difference. False positive rate versus precision. Now, what is exactly the difference? This is precision. The green uh, uh, half part and the uh, divided by the circle. And this is the false positive rate. And here we have the false positives in the denominator. And here we have the true negatives in the denominator. denominator. Now, how does this affect uh, our metrics for different uh, data scenarios? Let us see. OK, so uh, what I did in order to, uh, for us to understand better, I tried to simulate with this uh, simple uh, uh, diagram from Wikipedia. How does imbalance uh, data set look like for these metrics? So for example, if we have a majority of negative samples, for example, in the fraud example, then uh, the gray part is really big because most of our data is negative. It's not fraud, right? So in this case, and uh, for a majority of negative samples, if the true negatives, uh, I'm sorry, if the false positives is very small, um, I'm sorry, if the false positives is about the same, uh, the same size as all the positives, it's not very dominant because we have all these negatives in the denominator. Okay, so we will get um, a very low false positive rate in this case uh, uh, when we have majority negative samples, even if we have a lot of false positives comparing to the number of positives we have in the data. Now, on the other side, if we have majority of positive samples, for example, if we have um, many good deals we want to approve and only a, a few bad deals uh, we want to reject, um, then uh, the left side, the part of the positives will be very big. Now, we will have a lot of true positives because we have a lot of uh, um, positives, so it's easy to detect these. And the precision would look very skewed because we will have a lot of true positives and the false positives would have a, a very small impact on, the, uh, on this uh, ratio, okay? So even uh, um, if we have a, a little false, if, if we have a lot of false positives comparing to the number of uh, 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 negatives, we would not feel it much with the precision because it's, it would still be high. Now, if that wasn't clear, we would see a couple of uh, examples for this. Now, first example is a majority of positive samples. And in this case, we have a model which predicts all the samples as positive. A very bad model, right? Because it doesn't detect negative samples at all. Now, what we see here, here I calculated the best basic matrix. And we see that the precision is 90%, which is really high. And the recall is 100%. It's really good, right? Uh, the true positive rate is 100%, it's exactly the recall, but the false positive rate is 100%. This reflects that the model is actually not a good model. So in this case, we see that the true positive rate and false positive rate is more suitable to reflect the actual performance of this model. Now, if we take the same example, but switch the labels, we can see that both metrics are the same. So it has a meaning which is a, the, the majority class, a positive class or a negative class. Now, I will skip this example because it's similar. Yeah, can you raise your voice? 
Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, and I will just, well, I'll just skip to the last example because I don't have time. Um, so if I have a majority of negative samples and a minority of positive samples, if we classify all the samples as positive, um, but only one is really positive, again, a very bad model, um, in this case, we see that uh, true positive and false positives, uh, I'm sorry, these are all the metrics we calculate. The precision in this case is very low. The recall is very high, so this reflects good that the model is actually not good. But the true positive rate is the, rec the recall again, and the false positive rate actually not that high. So it doesn't say that the model is that bad. So in this case, the precision is low and the false positive rate is not high, which means that uh, uh, precision recall reflects the model performance much better in this case. So uh, I don't have uh, a time to conclude, but you can read the uh, conclusions at home, but uh, just take, <laughs> just take uh, uh, these two tips uh, from me to life. Just think which would be the better metrics and guide yourself with which one is the majority class, the positive or the negatives, and maybe you can switch them. Okay, yeah. hi everyone. My name is Chacha. I'm a research intern at Spark Beyond and also pursuing my master at the computer science department at the Technion. And my talk today will be about how we can better derive confidence in our regression models and how can we have more insights about the problem we have every day, possibly encouraging a better decision making. So to start, let's, let's just recap what we usually do in, in regression models and what quantile regression is. Okay. So usually in a regression model, we model the average relationship between set of features X and an outcome variable Y based on the conditional mean function. For example, you can think about trying to estimate the arrival time from Haifa to Tel Aviv based on some uh, data set of observation and, and your model will come into conclusion and into a prediction of, of one hour. While this approximation might sound reasonable for the mean function, if I planned my travel to Tel Aviv today according to this prediction, there is significant probability I would be late. Quantile regression aims at providing much more information on the distribution of Y given X. To be more concrete, let's, for any quantile between 0 and 1, we want to be able to predict a value v such that with probability q, our estimation will be above the real value. Okay, with such modeling, we can come, we can predict, for example, the, the v95%, where the semantics for this prediction is that I'm confident with 95% that I will arrive on time to pi data if I follow this prediction. There are many, many motivations for why we need quantile regression. I'll give you just a taste. So uh, as I started showing on the previous slide, sometimes this information is quite essential. Uh, I'm not confident enough in the, in the mean function approximation to take actions. I want to know about probabilities and about outcomes. Sometimes I'm more interested in high probability events. Sometimes I want to know about rare events. I don't know crisis. I want to prepare myself better. Another motivation is that quantile regression gives us a direct way of estimating utility function. As if we want to estimate a utility, if we have probabilities and outcomes, we can more accurately uh, compute the, the expected utility function. And with that, we can adjust our prediction according to the customer preferences. Another thing we can do with quantile regression, and we can try and find anomalies in our data. Let's say, for example, if we have some sensor that should be below 70 degrees with 95% uh, confident, then if we see in our data some, some sensor that takes the, the value of 100, some observations, we should be suspicious about, it obser about that observation, possibly uh, moving it of our data. Okay, let's look at example of how quantile prediction looks like on the famous Kagel House pricing data set. This screenshot, by the way, is taken from the Spark Beyond platform. The, the engine does the whole data science process end-to-end -end from data preparation to feature search, engineering, modeling, evaluation, and much more. 
the leftmost column is the real sell price of that property. The rightmost column is, is a random forest approximation of the mean function. And in between, you can see uh, various quantiles of the conditional probability distribution for these examples. So looking at this, we can almost right away talk about confidence intervals. Let's see uh, the first example. If, if we look only on the random forest prediction, we, s we can see that we are actually overestimating this property. But having this column only, we have no indication for what's going to happen. So if we didn't know the real sale price and, and we were trusting this, no indication for surprise. But taking all this information into account, we actually see that the real sale price sits somewhere inside the, the interquartile range, which is between the 0 0.25 and 0 0.75 quantiles. So we actually expect 50% of our prediction to fall into this range. So it's not so surprising. If I have all this information, I could get ready for this situation. No surprise. Okay, let's uh, dive a bit deeper into the math behind quantile regression and to actually how we're going to estimate the quantiles. Okay, so the first approach will be a loss function based optimization. We want to optimize a quantile regression loss, a quantile regression objective. This objective minimizes a sum that give us symmetric penalties to over prediction errors and under prediction errors. Okay, let's think for example about the 0 0.9 quantile. The quantile loss will take the form 0 0.9 times the under prediction errors plus 0 0.1 the over prediction errors. Means we are punishing the under prediction harder than the over prediction. Is smooth penalty function. But you get a non smooth penalty function. Okay, so the reason why we're doing it is because we want to see other places of the distribution. So if we are punishing asymmetrically, we punish the under prediction errors nine times harder than the over prediction errors. We are pushing our what? No problem. We are pushing our prediction towards the right side of the distribution and so our our estimator will tend to overestimate. We are doing this for various quantiles so we can have the whole picture. Um, okay, so the intuition that what we want to do is we want to, to take our predictions to, to a various places of the distribution to get a better understanding of the whole distribution. And let's assume uh, on the same quantile that our uh, quantile approximation function takes the form of some feature vector times some parameter vectors beta. The, the loss function takes the exactly the same form with the quantile times the under prediction error plus one minus the quantile times the over prediction errors. Okay, now we're approximating this function. Uh, this function is not differentiable everywhere, so you can't use vanilla gradient descent, but smoothed approximation on, of this function does exist on the literature. And, and even w one, of, one such approximation you can find in the gradient boosting, in the scikit learn gradient boosting methods. All you need to do is specify the loss function to be the quantile loss and to choose what quantile you want to model. Another option in, is a bagging-based approach. We want to further exploit a bag of model to do this job. The main idea is to train the bag in a way that will represent the full conditional probability distribution of y given x. And the, the main problem with this is what we usually do, we train on the same data, so, so our predictors tend to be highly correlative. We want to break this correlation and we do it by further bootstrap sampling our data set and or restricting our features. Okay, let's look at random forest based algorithm for example for following this idea. We can do one of the two. Option one, instead of retrieving, what we usually do is we are taking the mean, the average over the leaf. We can retrieve all the observation at leaf over all the bag. Then we can sort it and treat it as is the full distribution and derive whatever quantiles we want. Another option is that we expand the tree fully up until one sample per leaf, then retrieving the whole bag. If, if we have enough predict predictors, we can hope to, to approximate the, the full conditional distribution. And from there, it is straightforward to, to derive the quantiles. Now, when using this method, one should remember that there is a trade-off between the accuracy of the predictors and their independence. And we actually control this trade-off with the with the size of our bootstrap sampling. Okay, some empirical result. We've tested both the gradient boosting uh, quantile loss and the tree distribution I've just described. 
the, the goal here is to predict the 0 0.9 quantile. So the semantics for this prediction is that we are expecting 90% of our prediction to overestimate, okay? And this is actually what we measure here. The y-axis is the percentage, of, the percentage of example overestimating the real value. Uh, and this, this result seems promising on both of the methods. Uh, the tree distribution seems a bit better on this quite extreme quantile, achieving an absolute error of less than 10% on 15 of the 18 data sets. And this is quite impressive because the, you need a lot of information to, to be able to to model unique quantiles. Another fast comparison, this is also comparing the two methods, the, the x-axis or the zero point is the gradient boosting performance on the empirical loss that we saw earlier. And the y-axis is the increase or decrease in performance that risk distribution have over the gradient boosting. Also here we don't see a clear winner, but, but begging seems a bit better at, at this extreme quantile. Okay, so to summarize, we've seen the problem of quantile regression and we understood a bit what it can help us with respect to standard mean regression. We've seen two approaches, two possible approaches for estimating this quantile. We saw some evaluation and, and during the way I've tr I was trying to give you some possible application like confidence interval, anomaly detection and others, but you should be able to think about many more applications for quantile regression. Thank you. Questions? Can you compare your method with uh, Bayesian regression? Actually, no. <laughs> Maybe you should consider, uh, uh, I guess, in Bayesian regression, you're using prior. The posterior looks like the one that the crowd flower is one before. Yeah. The crowd flower seems to be like outlining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The quantile regression is no is not magic. If this information, if you can't find this information based on your features, if your representation is not good enough, you can't hope it to do very good on other quantiles. So this model is we probably didn't have very good representation feature-wise for this model, so we could not expect it. We didn't have a good approximation of the mean function as well here, so we couldn't hope to have such a good quantile approximation, but it looks like it is very low, but 60% is not very low, because if you think about it, the mean approximation should be around the 50. So, so it's not very bad, but yes, this is the worst among them. Anyone else? Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm very excited, excited to be here as always. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, background removal with uh, deep learning. Uh, first of all, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Gidi. Uh, I'm a freelance uh, machine learning consultant and uh, do all kinds of uh, projects for uh, companies. Um, and I uh, keep some time for doing my own projects and uh, products. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this product that I did uh, with uh, my partner, Alon, uh, who is going to talk uh, after me, uh, which is uh, background removal with uh, deep learning. So uh, what is a uh, background removal? We started the project uh, a few months ago. And um, at, September, at the beginning of September, we released, uh, we released uh, the product. If you, if you have the quick fingers, you can uh, go to this site and try it, maybe later, um, with a blog post and code and everything. Um, and I'm going to talk about the, this project, how we did it, why we did it, and uh, how you can do it, maybe, or some projects. So, uh, first, our uh, philosophy, why uh, we're doing such a project, which uh, we don't get, get paid for or, uh, or anything else when we, we do, when we have uh, other things to do. So uh, first, um, this is a, a way of doing uh, products. Um, first, uh, building a, a, small, uh, a small prototype and seeing, uh, and seeing the market need, like if uh, someone likes it, someone uh, is interested in it. In my opinion, this is a good way of doing a product. Uh, second, uh, having fun, of course, uh, sharing our experience with the community in a blog post 
you can read everything. You, we have the code there, how we did it, everything. Uh, PR, of course. And uh, improving our skills in deep learning. Not all of our projects, uh, uh, I talk about myself, not all of my projects they include the uh, state of the art uh, techniques. So, in my spare time, I like to try uh, uh, deep learning and stuff. So, uh, background removal. Um, I'm not going to explain. You see in the picture what it is. Uh, actually, uh, our product is uh, about all about taking a, a selfie or a, some kind of a portrait of a person and then uh, removing the background. Uh, what else you can do with it? Whatever you like. You can put another background of a Y or whatever. And the commercial use cases uh, are various. Uh, well, the first you can think of is a green screen at the movie industry. Uh, all kinds of picture, picture manipulations. Um, and uh, as we learned recently, uh, the ad industry has also uh, very much uh, uh, interest in uh, such a uh, product. Uh, this, by the way, is not uh, this, by the way, is not from our product, but is, uh, our results are uh, pretty close. We will show you mm -hmm. later. Uh, so uh, after we define the, the task. Uh, we then are uh, going to machine learning to find uh, the uh, technique I'm going to use. So the technique is uh, semantic segmentation. Uh, anyone here uh, haven't heard of it? Anyone heard of it? Okay. So uh, semantic segmentation is a really uh, famous task in, uh, in uh, deep learning, machine learning. It's, it has uh, many, uh, many projects, many algorithms out there in the GitHub uh, that you can use. So uh, we felt uh, pretty safe uh, in doing uh, in uh, going this way. Uh, you can see here what is the uh, semantic segmentation. It's taking uh, it's taking a picture and segmenting it uh, by the by its objects. Uh, like here in the picture, you see the motorcycle and the rider. Uh, actually, it's an interesting problem because you need to segment every pixel in the picture. So after we defined uh, the problem and, uh, and the algorithms we want to use, we went to look uh, for data sets. Uh, there are not many data sets for this kind of uh, problems because uh, it's really hard for uh, people to tag uh, pixel by pixel. So uh, there are uh, not as many uh, data sets as uh, in other problems. And there are three, there are three main data sets in, uh, this, uh, for semantic segmentation. Uh, one is called Coco, one is called Canvid, and one is called Voc. Uh, the Canvid data set is, uh, is the top one here. Is, it doesn't fit our problem because it uh, has a picture of streets and stuff. So, but the Coco is, uh, really, uh, has very, really various pictures, like this one of the people standing uh, at the background. So this is a good data set uh, that we chose. Uh, after we chose the data set, we wanted uh, to uh, filter it because uh, there are many pictures which uh, may seem relevant, but they are not relevant for our project. Like you can see, the middle picture is like uh, not really a portrait, many noise. Uh, this picture, uh, the person is really small, so it's not a good fit for our uh, product. Uh, the left one is good, so we went uh, on filtering only these pictures were fit. Uh, for task, and we left out uh, from uh, 100,000 pictures in the data set with only uh, 10,000. Uh, a little bit about uh, semantic segmentation algorithm. Um, I'm sure many of you know about uh, how deep learning works. So uh, the interesting thing about semantic segmentation is uh, that its algorithms are really uh, similar to the algorithms of uh, image classification. Um, you can see an example, a schematic example, like hand waving of a, of a, a classification algorithm. You give him a picture and uh, it returns the cat. So taking the same algorithm and uh, expanding the last layer, actually building it, build, using it as a decoder, uh, can give you a heat map of the picture and actually segment the cat. This is like uh, one of the early versions of the, algorithm, of the algorithms. But uh, this is the main idea in uh, all the semantic segmentation algorithms. So when training, we focused on uh, two uh, quite famous models of uh, semantic segmentation. One is called UNET, one is called Turing 2. Uh, we first tried, to, tried it with a small amount of images. 
Uh, really quickly, we saw that the tiramisu had uh, better results, and the unit like gave us uh, things that are uh, really blobbish. So we went on with the tiramisu. Um, I'm going to explain you a, a little bit about it. So the thing about this model that, as I said earlier, it's really built from a picture uh, classification uh, algorithm, the, the DenseNet. DenseNet is a classification algorithm which uh, uh, went out in 2017. It's really good, has really good results. Uh, really <coughs> compact, uh, works with small uh, amounts of data. And uh, this one, the tiramisu, is actually the same thing with uh, a decoder layer. Um, actually, uh, many decoder layers, but it uh, does the same thing as the classification uh, algorithm. And um, this is how it works in high level. Whoever is interested in going deeper can read the post. Um, so after having uh, the algorithms, the task, and everything, the data set, we defined our metric, which is uh, IOU. Uh, this is uh, one of the accepted metrics for semantic segmentation, inter intersection of the union. Uh, and we started uh, training and retraining and uh, doing all kinds of things with the data set, uh, uh, trying different type of parameters. And uh, sorry about the low quality, but you can see the, the idea that 88% uh, uh, IOU may be good for a few things, but here is like uh, only 90, 95% bring us to results that uh, we can uh, release. Um, these are examples uh, from, our, uh, from our product. I must say that we don't save, uh, save data of users who use the product, so I... Uh, I found myself without any examples, so I like looked at my WhatsApp way that I sent to friends and I took the photos from there. Um, but uh, I can say that uh, around uh, half of the pictures uh, give uh, good results like this, and if you try uh, pictures like underwater or something, it uh, won't be good. Um, so uh, further uh, progress, how can we uh, further progress? Uh, I have, uh, don't have enough time. I only will talk about uh, the matting. So the matting is another problem, uh, which is not semantic segmentation. It's like something uh, a bit, uh, a bit more focused, like doing semantic segmentation, which, which is really fine and uh, and precise. And uh, this is a problem which is not much is not much discussed at the, the internet. So we tried a little bit, and then we we quit uh, doing this because uh, it like felt like going too far. Uh, this can be a future uh, improvement of the product. So, uh, to summarize, uh, machine learning products uh, is great. You can do, do them by yourselves. Uh, they're fun. Uh, you have to feature the test, data, model, training, and uh, we reach uh, our entire data set 25%. To be commercial, we need to get to 95%. Do you think you can reach it? How it is compared with older models, like OpenCV models? Um, before, before the deep learning. It's much better. OpenCV, like they reach, as, as far as I know, they reach, um, I, don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but the deep learning in semantic segmentation is much better. Like if I throw over a number, like maybe 70, 80% IOU tops. Yes. Not a question, but it's more of comment. It's, uh, this is a very specific case of segmentation where uh, synthetic data can be very easy to achieve in, for increasing your uh, training data set. To collect from Google uh, data with no background, create a background rendering and just uh, overlap the images and increase your uh, training set. Is it uh, something that you investigated or not? Uh, we did some uh, ex experiments, but uh, we had uh, we felt like we have enough da data. We have uh, 10,000 of images and uh, like uh, running on uh, one or two GPUs, it's, uh, it's like enough. We haven't reached the problem of uh, when, when we need more, more data. But uh, it's a good idea. Yes. You tried on the caravana challenge? Okay, Alon, uh, which uh, is going to talk after, talk after me about the deployment, he, re he uh, tried the Kavana and reached 18. Okay, 28, 18. I think 18. <laughs> <laughs> Something else? What about video? Uh, 
Uh, video is a bit different thing because it's, uh, it's a bit easier because you have the previous uh, image. So if you use the previous image, you can, like, if something moves, you can uh, segment it uh, easier. So um, it's, a, it's a direction we we're thinking of about uh, when we think about how to continue, but uh, it's, a, it's a bit different. Okay. I'm doing a little bit of a different talk than what we've seen uh, up until now. As Giddy talked, uh, we've uh, been thinking how to productize deep learning solutions. And uh, as part of it, we chose this problem of background removal, which is fun. Uh, we open source the code and the model and the deployment. Everything is open source and is available on GitLab. And you can see the server demo, uh, as well as the client-side uh, solution, uh, which was implemented in KS.js. Uh, for today, I will only have time to probably talk about the server-side solution. And uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Alon Burg. Um, so uh, somebody was asking about the Carvana uh, Kaggle competition. Uh, uh, we, I reached a rank of uh, 28. And uh, currently, we're doing a C discount Kaggle competition. So if anybody is uh, doing oversampling right now, please give us a call afterwards. Um, I would like to stress uh, how nice it is that once you have uh, something working to be able to deploy it and see real uh, results in, in, the, in production. And that's why I'm going to talk about serving with continuous integration. Uh, the tools we, which we chose, uh, so at least the, the background removal uh, was trained using, uh, using a deep learning framework uh, that's called Keras. Uh, who's familiar with Keras, maybe? OK, sweet. So uh, I, I wasn't sure how many of you guys are uh, deep learning. Uh, and uh, the tools that we chose for serving is uh, Flask, which is a micro framework for uh, web development. So basically, you can just take one, one file and uh, do the serving and uh, uh, static HTML. And, st and uh, we you will use Git LFS, uh, which uh, I think it, uh, no, not many are aware of, of uh, Git LFS, but it's an important tool if you're trying to uh, save and version control your uh, model and your binaries and weights. So uh, Git LFS was released by GitHub uh, some time ago. And um, once you have this, this running and uh, tied up to, to, the, um, to your product, it's very nice to be able to commit your weights and have like a one gig file sitting version control well and being deployed at the same time. Uh, we will use uh, Docker container, uh, con for containerization. And uh, what Docker allows us is to build reproducible uh, environments which can uh, both run on your uh, production server and development machine. And uh, we will use Heroku for free serving. Uh, I always uh, like to, to note the, the small notes, so I, I wrote down that if you're into trying to serve your stuff, uh, you might consider checking out Scalewell, which is a European server uh, company which really has some cheap offerings. Uh, you can get a 24 euro, uh, 8 core, 32 giga RAM, and fi uh, 58 uh, giga SSD. And OVH, with, uh, which is currently our preferred uh, server hosting, uh, you can get a $150 month uh, dual GTX 1060, which is really nice. Uh, and I should uh, stress that it's dedicated, meaning it's not, it's not cloud, that performance is super. And then finally, we will use uh, GitLab CI, uh, which is tying everything up. Uh, so basically, we can just, uh, somebody can do a pull request for the weights or do an improvement to the model push the weights, and it's all being deployed and being served free. So uh, I won't go over all the code and won't bore you too much, but just so you can see, this is open source. It's available. If anybody wants to do a pull request, it will be deployed automatically by just one click. And uh, you can see that at the top, we're loading the model uh, with Keras. 
uh, we're setting up a default uh, session since uh, this is multi-threaded environment, so we need to take care of that. Uh, since we're doing uh, background removal, so you can see the parts where we're taking the image from the request, we're resizing it, uh, predicting the semantic segmentation as Giddy was explaining, meaning trying to find out which pixels are, are actually the, the people in the, in the uh, image, and then uh, using those pixels that we found out to, uh, to give the transparency layer, and then bring, uh, pushing it back to the response, to the HTTP response. And at the bottom, you can see that just the home page serving, which is a static HTML. Um, uh, just uh, digging deep, uh, deeper into Git LFS. So if you're going to install Git LFS, uh, use the instructions from the website, and uh, you will have to uh, do in, to install the hooks for Git so that every time you push uh, um, changes to the binary files, it's actually not pushing directly to Git. It's uh, uploading separately from from Git. Git has a uh, been known to not uh, handle nicely big files uh, since it's, it has this uh, acyclic graph who, uh, and uh, it's computing the SHA ones. And you don't find so that, that every time somebody clones the repository, he will have to download all the history of the models. That's why Git LFS was invented. Um, so, three commands will get you going. And then finally, Docker. I hope uh, nobody will get too bored uh, or uh, annoyed because Docker can sometimes be a pain. But um, the idea of Docker is that you can containerize your environment. You can set up uh, the entire uh, tree OS dependencies uh, with just a few lines. Uh, in this example, we are actually taking. We are starting from uh, Heroku Miniconda image. You can see the top line. Um, we're installing the requirements, and then finally, the last command is how we're actually running the web server. Um, so this helps us actually run the same way as production, and also on my uh, local laptop. And uh, we use uh, Heroku, which also supports Docker, uh, to deploy to uh, deploy our uh, model and uh, server. So after we we have built this Docker image, we we can provision uh, a free Heroku server. Uh, just one command. Uh, Heroku is a platform as a service um, company that abstracts all the DevOps operations, so you don't have to deal with memory scaling um, databases. And um, they have a nice free tier. Uh, and so finally, to tie everything up, uh, we can use GitLab. They have a nice offering for uh, groups. You can just uh, do private repos uh, for groups uh, free. And they have um, uh, a simple continuous integration solution in which you can just dump this uh, simple GitLab CI uh, YAML file. So, for example, ideally, uh, who's familiar with uh, continuous integration? Maybe, yeah. So, usually, it's uh, continuous integration might be a pain. I just want to show you how it can actually be easy and how satisfying it is to be able to, for somebody to just that might not be involved in the uh, deployment strategy or or might even not have creden credentials for actually deploying the the changes. Uh, it can just push changes to the code, and with uh, once you have it set up, it's it's working. So uh, the YAML file would go and uh, define the stages. So ideally, you would have something like build a Docker image, uh, test your server, test your code, finally deploy it to a staging environment, and then uh, deploy to production. And um, that, that's the workflow that I, I just uh, discussed. And you can see this is available online. You can all see uh, the history of our deployment. They log a real time once uh, a new commit is being pushed. The, the worker is uh, spinning up, and the build is coming up. 
and the entire thing is available, and uh, this is really nice. Uh, everybody can fork it. Uh, there's a Docker registry to see for history. Uh, that's it. I want to tell you about Jonathan. Jonathan is my youngest son. And I know that once he grows up and comes to me to get help in math or in physics, I'll always be there for him. But if one day he asks me anything about literature or poetry, I'll just send him back to his teacher or his mom. So the reason I'm sharing with you my embarrassing parenthood experience is that in many senses it's similar to raising kids is similar to raising machine learning uh, models. Um, we don't always have the information and the data and the data and the knowledge is very valuable so in some cases we need to get help from external entities. So when we're talking about children, it's obvious that we send our children to school, but we never do that when, when raising, when building machine learning models. We always do it in-house. So I have some experience with the algo trading firms, and uh, in my experience, we've done something similar to sharing knowledge and teaching each other um, and helping raising good machine learning models. What's special in algo trading firms is that it's very easy to encapsulate the business model into one small team. A very small team has its own expenses and its own revenues and uh, it's very easy to calculate how much does that team contribute to the PL of the whole firm. So in that case, we have that team. Uh, the team has uh, invested a lot in building its own data. So it has its own local data bank. The data bank is very expensive by getting the raw data. It needed to pay for the raw data, it cleaned the data, and uh, the data is fed into some uh, machine learning or deep learning model. Uh, the data is labeled or classified, and uh, every such team has its own loss function. And using such a system, uh, the machine learning uh, model fits. And at some point, it's, it's freezed out and deployed in order to trade in the exchange. Once it's deployed, it generates some orders. And um, the orders just, hopefully, they make money at the end of the day. Now, the advantage of such a system that the team is very focused. Everyone knows exactly what they need to do. Everyone knows what's the problem in case there is a problem. And, and the, um, all of the team is very focused to get the best possible revenue. But the disadvantage here is that they don't really help each other, the different teams. Every teams every, each one of the team only helps its own teammates. And they can help each other because every team knows a lot and has a lot of data that can help the other teams. So the solution we came up with is a, a system that enables the different teams to reward each other by teaching each other. So if I uh, go back to children, and sometimes I send my, my child to school or to a private uh, teacher. So in this case, I have a trainee team that puts up its, uh, its model onto the system. No one can see the model, no one can see the IP behind the model, but it, uh, that trainee team asks the other teams to contribute to it by 
feeding their data into the model and teaching it. So we have one trainee team and several trainer teams. The trainer team feeds the data into the machine learning model uh, with the labels. And the trainee teams need to put aside some of its data as a holdout and test data. Uh, at every, every sample or every batch of samples, the result of the holdout data is written into some holdout result certificate. And uh, at the end of the day, all of the result certificates are fed into some central contract. And according to that central contract, reward is paid to each one of the training teams. Now, the, the main problem here is what's going on in that field. How do we exactly reward each one of the teachers uh, in a fair way. For example, here we have a, some example of a typical learning curve, curve. And let's assume that one of the teachers was responsible for each one of these changes in the score, in the score of the model being uh, learned. So in some cases, the score went up. These are the green arrows. In the red arrows, the score went down. But how exactly do I reward that specific teacher? Was it a good one? Uh, we need to come up with, a, with some function that would reward the different teachers in a way that would be fair. Good teachers should be reward better than bad ones. We also need uh, the teachers to feel that they were uh, treated well. I mean, they need to know exactly how was the reward calculated. And we also need to predefine how much do I want to pay all of the teachers. And uh, one other problem that we've met when uh, introducing such a system is that because the entities are very separate and each one of the trading teams uh, looks only on his own benefit, some trading team try to take advantage of irrelevant issues. Uh, for example, if we know that the learning curve looks like that, and I'm a teacher, I'd like to teach the system in, in that area. Because in that area, the gradients are higher, there is some momentum, and even if my samples are not that good, I'll probably raise the learning curve, uh, curve up. So we need to come up with a, with a function that would uh, be able to answer all of these issues. So one type of a function I want to present here is, uh, is that one. In that case, for, for having that function, we need to approximate how, it, how approximately does the learning curve look like in such cases. So learning curves, I can classify them to learning curves like this one. This one is more sigmoidal. I can classify learning curves as some that would look more linear, some would look uh, logarithmic. So in this case, that's a sigmoidal learning curve. And in, uh, in our case, we have a teacher J that gave one sample, and that sample raised the score of the out-of-sample data from S0 to S1. Now, if I have the approximation of the learning curve, I can just, uh, I, I need to flip the approximated le learning curve such that the score would be on the x-axis and the iterations would be on the y-axis. So here we needed to flip and uh, rotate it. 
And if we take the derivative of that appro approximated learning curve, we get the function f here. The function f has, has some meaning. The function f is actually the amount of energy, energy in terms of iteration and samples, that is needed to be invested in our uh, fitting model in order to improve the score at each one of these points. So the actual reward for that specific teacher would be the sum of the improvements each one of its uh, samples uh, contributed. Each one of these samples in that equation is i. And for each one of the, uh, of the samples, the contribution is just the area beneath the f function uh, for the improvement that that sample gave. Now, th that's just uh, an equation that allows us to quantify the, uh, the contribution. Beyond that, in, in order for the teachers not to be able to fool the system, we need uh, to measure their contribution only in big batches. That's something else that is learned from such a system. And um, in that way, we, we were able to join several teams where each team only looks at his own benefit and allow them to somehow synergize each other and bring the other to new levels of, uh, of learning. Now, I guess you are tired and you don't want to ask questions, but you can. <laughs> but if not, uh, my mail is here. Yeah. Can we reward negatively? No, no. It can't be rewarded negatively. You, you need to take out of the system uh, ones that didn't uh, contribute. And there is a way to do that. Can you, like, kind of, uh, if someone contributes falsely, like, if you do the opposite or something like that? That system is built in a way that if someone uh, puts trash data in the system, it spits it out and it still allows the others to contribute. Yeah, no, continue and trash data, but something hazard, like okay, doing the opposite. That, that's just like trash data. In no, case. trash is the mean is zero. No. no. Okay, so even if it's negative, it spits out. Uh, giving sure. artificial uh, samples and improving its model unrelated to these samples artificially so that it will win good points as a teacher. Yeah, but eventually it will pay itself, so you earned nothing. It, it's just like you uh, teaching your, your own kid and paying yourself. Okay, thank you.